Hello? Bueller? Yeah, all right. Um, I think we're up and running. We'll give it just a little bit for folks to roll on in and, and find us, and uh, we'll get going. Uh, we're going to finish the book of Genesis today. I'm going to say it a lot of times because we're going to finish the book of Genesis today. Uh, <laughs> we'll wait uh, just a little bit, though, because if I finish it and nobody watches, does anybody learn anything? That's the real question. <coughs> Good afternoon, people. How you doing, Judy? Jacoby, hey, how's it going? Tara Lynn, great to see ya. We are, uh, we're gonna finish Genesis today. Brenda, good to see you. Linda, hi. All right. Um, hey, Cheryl, how's it going? Uh, I am filling in for Pastor Borkhart uh, one more day. Uh, we, we continue to keep uh, him and his whole family in our prayers. Uh, we, we, we did hear that uh, Thomas was, was also diagnosed with, uh, with COVID. Uh, hey, there's Pastor Borkhart. How you doing, buddy? How's the family holding up? Hey, Suzanne. Uh, hey, Jean. Um, we we uh, rejoice in the Lord this day for the victory over sin and death. Uh, and also for finally getting through the book of Genesis today. Uh, Pastor Borghart uh, begrudgingly gave me this uh, this study because this, this is one of his favorite verses, and it's just, it's a whopper. So we're going to dive right in because uh, uh, we got a lot to get to. We are in Genesis chapter 50. I'm going to pick up at verse 14 with just a little bit left. Uh, we have we have uh, Jacob dying, so let's, uh, let's zoom in on my ADHD and uh, get this thing going. Hey, Michelle, how's it going? Uh, all right, uh, so... Jacob fell asleep in our Lord. Um, he he uh, blessed his, his 12 sons. He, he gave them a great promise of, of everything that would be. Uh, these, uh, these, these 11 sons see the, the other, Joseph. Uh, and it seems like they kind of forgot that their father just blessed them and everything was going to be okay. And that Joseph had forgiven them and embraced them and taken care of them and everything. Because they, they see their, their father fall asleep and in um <laughs> in everything that's going on or, or even just um in in the nature that is old adam uh they're terrified all over again uh, joseph returned to egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father and when joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead they said it may be that joseph will hate us and pay us back for the evil that we did to him and so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers came also and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. Um, the guilty conscience revisited again. Um, let, let's recognize that this is a, a, the reason we do theology. Uh, the, the theology is done for the comfort of, of troubled consciences. And so we can just recognize that everything that's happening here, uh, the, the, the brothers have been forgiven by Joseph. They have been blessed by Jacob, but they're not necessarily looking at, at uh, God's word through, uh, through their, their father or their brothers. Uh, they're looking at themselves. They, they, they are concerned that, that something bad would happen to them because, well, that's exactly what they did to Joseph. They are expecting from Joseph themselves. They are, instead of uh, looking to, to God and his promises to define what they deserve, they're looking to the law. They're looking to their works, and they figure um, an eye for an eye sounds about right. Uh, we started the book of Genesis uh, 6 2020 um, and we made it. <laughs> instead of looking for themselves, they're going to be shown Jesus. This is a, a wonderful, wonderful thing called the gospel, that, that uh, those who, who come to, to Christ confessing their sins do not hear the condemnation of the law. They hear the mercy, the forgiveness of sins. They hear of Jesus who died upon the cross to forgive their sins. This is not about what's fair. This is about what's good. We've talked about this before, I think, but the fair is the enemy of the good. Fair is only ever really concerned uh, about what, uh, what somebody deserves, but good is concerned about mercy. The, the good Lord would not see us punished for our sins. And so here he, he actually then uh, points, uh, not to the law, but to the gospel. Um, 
it, it gives us reason to talk about confession and absolution. Uh, the, the brothers are, are, are still afraid. They're, they're still guilty. Uh, because there's a difference between um, necessarily knowing that you're forgiving and, and, and hearing that you're forgiven. There's a difference even between sort of trying to tell yourself that you are forgiven and being told that you are forgiven. Um, there, there is this wonderful gift that our Lord would bestow upon his church called absolution. Uh, that, that he would send forth uh, his pastors into the world to pronounce absolution upon sinners. So they don't just have to, to imagine that their sins are forgiven. And every single time we talk about absolution, everybody gets really upset and oddly enough starts quoting the Pharisees, uh, who can forgive sins but God alone. If the guy that you're quoting uh, was against Jesus, and you're trying to prove a point for Christianity, reevaluate your position. But we, we say, well, why do I need you to forgive my sins? Can't I just ask God to forgive me? And the answer is, yes, you can. And you should. Uh, we, we pray this, in fact, in the Lord's Prayer, and the Catechism directs us to do this. Uh, but before the pastor, we confess those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. See, when you're this funny looking, uh, every once in a while you walk by people and they laugh. Um, maybe the two aren't connected, but in my mind they always are. Uh, and so I can tell myself in my mind when I walk past a group of people and they start laughing, they are not laughing at me. It's okay. But you know what's better than just trying to convince myself? It's actually hearing it. It's actually hearing what's so funny to them and maybe even being brought up in and made a part of the conversation. And so we, uh, we have the gift of absolution, a hearing from the outside of yourself because your heart, your guilty conscience is the problem. And so why would you sue the guilty conscience from your conscience? Why would you, why would you calm a troubled heart from your heart? So your pastor gets to say, in the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. They get to hear this forgiveness of sins given to them uh, so that uh, when, when we deal with all of these things uh, going along, we, we actually get to, to not be rooted in, in our emotions or our pain or, or even what we deserve and expect from the law, but um, the, the gift of the free forgiveness of sins. And the two should never be set against each other because whenever uh, we, we try and deal with these things from our heart and not from our ears, we sort of grab hold of the things that are good and right and, and try and actually make them into righteousness. Uh, and so like we, we, we figure if I just fast enough or pray hard enough, then God will finally forgive me. If I, if I promise to do something to him, if I give penance, if I, if I pour out self-affliction upon myself, this, these were things Luther did to himself in the monastery. These are things that people still do today, that, that we just sort of figure, all right, I know God will forgive me my sins if I ask him, but I asked him and I don't feel better. So clearly I need to like up the ante a little bit and I need to pray more and I need to pray harder so he will really forgive me. I need to maybe give something up to show him that I'm serious. I, I need to, to, to hurt a little bit, not, not a lot, not, like, not, not what I actually deserve for my sins, but like the kind that I'll pick, um, not, not the eternity of, of hell, but like maybe, maybe I'll skip dessert for a little while to show God I'm serious about this one, at least as serious as I am when I'm uh, sneaking ice cream at 10 p.m. at night before bed. Um, in, in all of it, though, we take these, these, these things that we might be used to discipline the body, uh, and we try and use them as ways to, to buy a, a clean conscience. And the clean conscience doesn't have to be bought, it's given. And so Joseph won't let them try and buy their way back. He won't let them find themselves in him. He pronounces absolution. He gives the gift of forgiveness, even though he's already given it. And um, we've, we've, some pastors every once in a while have a little talk about this. Uh, you know, if somebody's already been absolved of their sins, like, should you do it again? Because, uh, like, what if what if they start to think that the absolution didn't work? Like, we don't re-baptize, and so why would we re-absolve? Uh, but these are different things given for different purposes. God gives us absolution so that we wouldn't have to try and convince ourselves that our sins really are forgiven. We, we can remember our baptism by making the sign of the Holy Cross. The wonderful joy of absolution is somebody from outside of you and, and your inward battle against old Adam actually gets to tell you who the winner is. It's Jesus. Your sins are forgiven you because of Jesus who died upon the cross for you. Um, the, the whole point of, of uh, absolution is to silence the evil one's accusations. Um, yes, does something actually happen when, when your sins are absolved? Yes, does something actually happen when your sins are absolved? Yes, we're not just reminding you about something. Absolution is forgiveness before God in heaven, bestowed through the, the servant of the Lord, given to you. Something is actually happening. Uh, but the things that are happening um, are, are twofold. Um, there, there are sort of uh, atonement theories that, that people talk about when they want to sound really smart. They'll say words like Anselmic and Christus Victor. And so I'm going to say those words so that you'll think I'm really smart. Uh, but but in reality, uh, we would talk about why our Lord would would set aright everything that, that has gone wrong since Adam and Eve 
fell into sin. And, and, and so the Anselmic view would, would be that uh, our, our Lord wants to, to save the sinners. And the Christus Victor view would be that our, our Lord wants to destroy the power of the devil. And these do not contradict. They, they work hand in hand. The problem actually sort of starts to come in when we let one completely triumph over the other. And so we completely ignore who we are in this, and this is just sort of a, this, this cosmic war between uh, the Lord and, and the, the peon that is the devil, and we just sort of happen to be on the winning side, or that there is no such thing as a spiritual warfare, and really all that matters is that Jesus loves you. And in both of these things, um, we, we lose sight of a larger picture that, that happened on the cross. Our Lord died upon the cross so that your sins would be forgiven and Adam and, and all who have fallen into sin would be saved and to destroy the power of the devil. Both. And so when we talk about absolution, uh, both of these things are being done. The evil one who accuses would be silenced and, and defeated in the words of absolution. When, when the devil tempts us into to trying to measure ourselves by the law and not the gospel, we can, we can see him conquered in the words of absolution. Uh, but we can also see uh, the, the sinners being forgiven. Uh, and so the question of does, does an absolution need to be re-pronounced? Um, need to or get to? Like, why are you going to make this a need to thing? If somebody comes to me with a guilty conscience, I'm going to be halfway out of my chair trying to forgive you because that, that's the gig. We get to, to pardon sin in the stead and by the command of Jesus. And so if you bring me a sin that I've already forgiven because it's still bothering you, we should still talk more about the victory over Christ. We, we shouldn't talk less about it. We shouldn't say, well, now that you've been forgiven, this is on you, and, and so here's the handoff, and now it's it's not semi-Pelagianism, but still just roll with it. Uh, it, it this, this is still Jesus doing it, but now you have to do it. No, we're going to forgive the sinners. This is this is how it works, because that's the source of all forgiveness. Um, Joseph actually talks about this. Uh, Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Stay off of verse 20. We're not there yet. Am I in the place of God? There is one place that forgiveness of sins comes from. There is one place that forgiveness of sins comes from. Let's go to Luke. Luke 6, 36. Uh, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. And we always want to sort of make this a, if I do this, then I get that. But you know who is merciful before you? Your Father who art in heaven. This is why we're taught to pray that the way that the way we are. Uh, Matthew 5, 9, in, in the, underneath my head, there it is. Uh, it, it's the petition in the Lord's Prayer. Um, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And this is not a, if I forgive, then God will forgive me. It's the source of all forgiveness. Look to one source for forgiveness. Are you in the place of God? Does forgiveness come from you? No. All forgiveness must come from Jesus. And the wonderful thing is then I don't have to go by how much my heart hurts over what's happening right now. I can go by the cross of Christ. I can look to the big dead Jesus hanging on the cross and I can say, my sins are forgiven because Jesus died for me. And then wonderfully, I can look to my neighbor and say, my heart is broken because of what you did to me. I hurt and I am angry because sometimes anger is easier to feel than hurt. So I'm going to lean on that one. And I don't know how to just not feel those things. So how do I forgive so that I would be forgiven and my Lord would remind you? Are you in the place of God? No. All mercy comes from the Father. So look to the big dead Jesus again. Your neighbor's sins are on that cross too. It's a wonderful reminder of mercy, both for you so that you can see your own sins being pardoned. But sometimes when you just need to see somebody else hurt, you can see the sins that, that bother you so much being punished. Look to the cross and see them being punished there, but then no. The mercy is there for them too. That you would be a source of, of, of mercy, even as your father is the giver of mercy. Not because you've got extra now, uh, but because you're continually going to him for all mercy so much so that when you look to the world, you would see nothing other than a whole bunch of sinners that Jesus died for. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. In all of this, uh, it, it's a recognition. We can do this thing by the law or the gospel. But if you want to do your, your neighbors only by the law, you hurt me so you deserve hell, punishment, pain. Well, a, a worldview that is wholly wrapped up in the law pretty soon starts to look at yourself in the mirror and not want to see the gospel, but only the excuses, the self-justification, the, the law. Instead, look to your neighbor in light of the gospel, the same gospel that you see given to you. Look to the cross of Christ to find forgiveness for you and for all. Joseph is probably still a little bit hurt over this. I mean, it's been, what, like, was it 13 years that, that he spent um, 
throughout all of this, uh, what, what time lost from his father, everything. Um, and, and maybe that was enough where he could totally get past it, but um, I, I don't know. I, I'm pretty good at holding a grudge. So instead of doing this by on whether or not I'm ready to forgive, do this on whether or not Jesus said it is finished, and then say, Lord, help my heart to match your cross. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Be a source of forgiveness for me. And then when I struggle with the concept, remind me, remind me where forgiveness is found for my neighbor so that my heart might start to look like your cross. In all of it, uh, Joseph is, is pointing not to himself as the pardoner of sins, not to himself as the forgiver, but to Jesus who, who forgives all sins. Then we can get to the big one. Uh, Genesis 1520. There's a lot to talk about here. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. As for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that happens here, so let's dive in. Let's start at the top. There's power in this verse. God has a power that nobody else in the whole wide universe does he can actually work good out of evil. I can actually take a pretty good day and get some good done. I can also take a pretty good day and work a lot of evil out of it. But only God can take an evil day and work good from it. It's a beautiful verse. Uh, it, it, it's a great promise that uh, God would not need to start over after the fall. It, it's a great promise that God would not need a perfect situation in order to work something good, or even perfect people in order to work something good, which is comforting considering what he's got to work with down here. Because if God can only work good out of good, he needs a new creation. He, he's got to just utterly destroy everyone who has fallen into sin and start over. But if God can actually work good out of evil, well, that means that a whole bunch of sinners down here, all working evil, God's still got plenty of good he can do down here. And this is done for a purpose. You meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. The point of this isn't just that God wants to sort of give you your, your, your best life now. The point of this is that God wants to bring about salvation. And well, if the people didn't need saving, um, that'd be because they were already good. God actually wants to save the sinners. And so he will work good out of evil. It's not just that cat, God, God can work good out of evil. It's that when God sees us down here, he wants to save us. And so it is his desire to work good out of evil. Because there, there are some things that I can do, but I don't necessarily want to do them, like dishes. Um, but you actually have a God who, who wants to work good out of evil for a goal, a specific point that, that you would be saved, that you would be kept alive. And so um, you see God's hand inside of everything that happened to Joseph as, as Joseph was cast down into the pit, raised up from literal death itself, as Joseph was sold into slavery, as Joseph was, was um, slandered against by Potiphar's wife, as Joseph was thrown into prison, as Joseph made his way up the ranks only to serve Pharaoh. God worked all of these things things so that the famine would not be an end to the promised seed of woman because it doesn't even just stop with people being fed it continues with judah who by god's working now receives a blessing that he would be of, of the lineage of jesus so it's no longer just you know the israelites who are kept from starving but, but through this messed up clan comes the savior of the whole wide world. God works all of these things. And you find God working evil for good in the fulfillment again. Um, imagine a, a day where, I, I don't know, um, somebody completely and totally innocent was uh, accused of something they didn't do, falsely arrested, uh, slandered on trial, beaten, mocked, spit upon, uh, maybe maybe hypothetically crucified, uh, while he was uh, betrayed by his friends and denied by them. Uh, I see a whole bunch of evil going on, lots and lots of sin. And I see God working great good on that particular Friday so much. Uh, so uh, that, that the Holy Friday can be called Good Friday, uh, because there God works good for you. He, he brings this about, um, ultimately, in the passion of, of the Christ, where he subjects himself to evil, 
he takes the evil that was going on in, in the heart of Judas, in the heart of the Pharisees, in the heart of Caiaphas, uh, and, and there he actually works so much good that everybody, even despite their awful intentions, or, or maybe sometimes they're, they're just misinformed intentions, because I think maybe Judas probably had good intentions what happened, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, um, he takes everything awful that's happening, and he works so much good that even as Caiaphas preaches, uh, it, it is uh, good that one man should die for the sake of his people. God's like, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> and then Caiaphas, the evil high priest who wants to, to sort of abscond from God, the priesthood for the power for himself, he ends up sacrificing the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Even as Caiaphas wants to kill an innocent man, he ends up doing the, the wonderful work of the priesthood offering the sacrifice of Jesus who takes away the sin of the world. God works for good for those he loves. And that's a wonderful thing in a world this messy, because then I can stop looking at how messy the world is to try to determine whether or not God would have something to do with it. That's so much so um, the impotence of, of the world. Uh, that, that's the religion of the prosperity gospel too, that if God really loved me, there would be no evil around me. If God really loved me, it was because I would stop sinning so much. And if God really loved me, nothing bad would happen to me. Uh, and in all of it, you're only looking at the world, and you're never actually looking at the character of God. Yours is the God that loves you so much that he'll dive right into the middle of the evil to save you from it. Yours is the God who loves you so much that uh, as, as he sees everything going wrong, he would make himself a part of it to redeem you so that you can look at the world and say, yeah, world's full of evil, me, full of evil too. But God can work good from this evil, and God wants to work good from this evil because he wants to save me. He wants to save me so much that he would not abandon me to this mess, but he would redeem me from it. He would work good down here. Um, and that's a healthy thing. But there is a way that maybe isn't healthy to talk about this. Uh, let's, let's grab the verse one more time. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So we can look back over the whole story of Joseph and we can say, boy, God really had a plan there. Um, but maybe don't talk that way, <laughs> please. Um, because yes, God does have a plan for your life. There's a plaque about it in ha like every Hobby Lobby in every different font imaginable. But unless you're actually currently being held in captivity by Babylonians, that verse isn't for you. Um, instead, recognize that uh, when God works, yes, he does have a plan, but he usually doesn't tell you about it. And that's okay. Um, we, uh, in the complicated theological world, have... Um, complicated theological uh, complicated theological vocabulary for this. It is God's revealed will versus God's hidden will. Uh, and they should sort of define the term. Um, <laughs> inside of uh, God's revealed will, he actually tells us what to expect. God's revealed will is the scriptures. This is where he sets forth who he is. So that we can start to define all of the other things that are going on. This is what Pastor Borkhart is uh, talking to right now. Pastor Borkhart uh, cites Job to, shall we expect good from the Lord and not evil? Well, is the Lord good or is the Lord evil? That's a simple question. Look to his word. He actually tells you. He actually shows you. Yours is a good God. And that means that uh, from him, you should expect good things. What's a, what, a, what a wonderful gift is that God can have a plan for your life and not want to tell you about it. Because if, if God's plan for your life is only executed upon you properly understanding it, all of you are in trouble. This is the, the wonderful thing. I'm gonna, after this, I'm going to go take my kids camping. Um, but I'm not going to make them figure out how to drive to the campsite. I'm going to just say, I'm going to get you there. You don't have to know every step of the way. You don't have to know every turn. Trust me, I got this. I, I'm telling you where you will end. And you let me handle the middle part. The middle part is hidden from you. You, you wouldn't understand it anyway. It's a gift that, that God would hide parts of his will from us. Uh, because how could we comprehend this? His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. He is bigger than us, smarter than us, holier than us. And so if we could perfectly understand what was going on with God, we would need a much better God. Like really, if, if you can perfectly understand your God, your God is disappointing to everyone. <laughs> You cannot work the complicated functions on your washing machine. Are you telling me you can perfectly understand the will of him who created the heavens and earth and still keeps them spinning to this day? 
If God is not smarter than you, get a better God. If God is not holier than you, with a better intent than you, uh, a, a holier intent than you, get a better God. Because uh, that at best is just a bully. Uh, instead, look to the character of God as revealed in his word. God's revealed will is the sacred scriptures. Look to the Bible. And then recognize it's a gift that there is not a book of Harrison that tells me everything that I ought to do in this life. I have 10 things that I ought to do from God already in this book. And I have failed to do them every time almost. Really, God has laid out what he expects from you. He gives you 10 commandments. If, if he gave you a book of do this every single day of your life and everything would be great, you would still not do it because you're a sinner. He gives you the Ten Commandments and you ruin those. Why would you do with a whole book? Seriously, people, get it together. Instead, look to the fact that God's revealed will testifies of Christ who came to save sinners. God's revealed will is that those who have not done well, who have not done right, who have not made good choices, who have sinned, those ones are the ones he has redeemed by dying on the cross, by rising from the dead, by sending forth the Holy Spirit through the waters of baptism to redeem you and mark you as, as one sealed into the covenant of grace, his own child, a part of his body, and an heir to life everlasting. You can know who you are in Christ so that even if you don't know how you're going to get to the resurrection, you can know you are already a part of it so firmly that you would call yourself a saint, a holy one, a, a resident of the kingdom of God. Not after you're dead and we can go back over things and say, yep, God had a plan there, but because he has promised in his word. That lets God's hidden will uh, be a mystery to us because instead of asking why and how, we can go back to asking who. God's revealed will is who. Who is your God? The why is this happening and how do I fix it? Those are usually in God's hidden will, but there's very little comfort in God's hidden will. You end up saying things that are super unhelpful, like God is everywhere, but then you have to say God was in the hurricane. And, and, and I'm not saying he wasn't, but I don't know what he was doing, and so there's not a lot of comfort in it. I, it's, it's honestly, it, it's sort of like um, the fact that I have little kids and they don't always understand every aspect of me as a human being. Uh, there are some parts of my vocations that they don't need to see, they don't need to walk in on. I have a role as a husband uh, that, that when I'm spending time with my wife, I don't want my kids to walk in. Uh, I don't want them to see that they wouldn't understand it. Why are you guys wrestling? I'm just, oh, okay. Um, inside of all of it though, when we start to just jump into what God is doing in a place that is so much bigger than we could possibly understand, why do you think that that would make perfect sense to you? Of course God was in the hurricane, but I don't know what he was doing. So instead, I want to focus on who your God is. Yours is the God who loves you. Yours is the God who redeemed you from sin. And in all of this, God would work mercy. So that when you go to the hidden world, I can say, I have no idea what he's doing right now. But I know who he is. He is a good God. So I should expect good from him. This is a great gift that, that we would be able to address God's hidden will in light of his revealed will, not God's revealed will in light of his hidden will. I've been making it weird for a long time now, Jacoby. Um, look to what God's speaking uh, in this. And then you can say, God has a plan for your life, but that plan only needs to be specified insofar as he has redeemed you from sin and death by his death and resurrection. He has marked you as his own by the waters of baptism. And then say, yes, whatever has to do be done to get me from here to the resurrection, he'll take care of it. Don't worry. Um, this is a, a, a good thing. And this lets us actually start to deal with the scary part. As for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. The scary part is that God did this to Joseph. God did this to Joseph. God meant it for good. That means God had a hand in what was going on. Uh, we, we've got a way that we try and talk about this to sort of get God off the hook for things we don't like. Uh, we, we talk about, you know, did God allow this or did God cause this? Uh, but here's the thing. If you are the all-knowing, all-powerful being, uh, you're on the hook for what happens. Like if I'm in the driveway and I'm watching my kids play in the street and I see a car coming and I don't get them out of the street, I allow the truck to hit them. I'm not a good dad. And, and also a, a God who allows evil but doesn't cause evil, even when he could do good, he's culpable. God allowed, fine, but if you could have stopped it, let's go ahead and attach God caused. God did this to Joseph. Um, and, and that's okay to talk about, uh, because we have, we have the, the, the promise of his revealed will. Um, that way we can talk about him as, as if 
Well, he's not impotent, and he's not ignorant, and he's not unloving. Remember to go back to the who when you see God doing these things. God is capable of stopping it, but isn't. Which means, well, maybe he doesn't understand it. No, God understands it. But most of all, God loves me. So that which he's doing to me right now isn't a monster at work. It isn't a bored kid with an anthill. It isn't anything awful that anybody else would say. It's a God who actually wants to work good. And if evil is the only thing that he has at hand to work it with, he'll work it there. Where does God place himself in the midst of this suffering? That's the real question. Where is God in the middle of suffering? Well, he's on the cross. He's bearing that suffering. God is on the cross, saving the sinners, not apart from the misery, not apart from the pain, not apart from the suffering, but right in the middle of it. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, Pastor Borkhardt again. Uh, St. Augustine does the whole God allowed it but didn't do it thing. The scriptures don't protect God. Even when God does evil, he's doing it for good. Um, you have to be able to embrace a God who can work good out of evil so that when you find a God in the middle of evil, you can actually find shelter from the evil in God instead of having to protect God from the evil. Have you ever noticed that about Christians, though? We spend so much time with, with our, our descriptions of why God's totally off the hook for this thing, that the God who we should be seeking shelter in when everything's falling apart becomes the one God we want to keep at arm's length from it because we want to keep him safe from everything that's wrong. We want to keep him safe, his reputation clear of everything that's happening. The God that you need to protect is not the God that can protect you. You have the God who gives you shelter. You have the God who calls you to take refuge in him. His reputation can take the hit. He was mocked upon the cross for sin. His reputation can take the hit because at the end of this, he will still work good out of all of it. You don't need to protect God's reputation by trying to find a way to explain what's going on that keeps him far away from trouble. He puts himself right in the middle of trouble, dying upon the cross for the sinners who put him there. Rejoice, because God is not apart from the suffering. You don't need to protect him from it either. Which, of course, leads to what everybody is concerned about, the abuse, potentially. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. So clearly that means I should just keep on doing evil because God will work good out of it no matter what, right? It's that old, shall we sin, that grace may abound verse? Well, by no means. Um, but recognize what's happening here, because this is actually a really great story uh, to, to kind of find uh, where we, we talk about uh, God's mercy being proclaimed to sinners who might just sin again. Remember who is, is being uh, addressed here. This is not spoken to people who are sinning right now, but to people who are despairing. Joseph's brothers come to him saying, Please don't, please don't do to us what we did to you. Please don't leave us out starving. Please don't throw us in the pit and leave us for dead. You, you could do all of those things right now. You've got a whole band of soldiers right there. You could get it done. Uh, this is not a people who are, are super intent on going out to do evil things. This is a people who uh, have wrestled with a guilty conscience over sin and have lost. These are people who are hurt. And so, Joseph comforts them. Joseph preaches the gospel to the people who need forgiveness. That's the answer every time. The blessings poured forth from Jacob kind of still show, uh, shall you sin that grace may abound? No, because it's going to hurt. Remember the consequences given to Levi and, and Simeon and, and Reuben and the blessings. Remember that their actions don't go without consequence. They just also don't go without mercy. Sin breaks stuff. That, that means that if you sin a lot, your sins will be forgiven, but life will still be harder on you. You, you, can, you can take up drug use. Don't take up drug use. Recognize that the, the sins that would come from it can be forgiven on the cross, are forgiven on the cross. But your life is still going to get worse. Sin breaks stuff. That's a great reason not to do it. But inside of all of this, though, watch Joseph's brothers who recognize they've already been busted up. They've already sinned, and right now they're, they're facing all of the consequences and all of the despair and all of the, the, the bruised conscience from it. And the thing that Joseph wants to rule the day is not a, now what if they take advantage of this? It's mercy. 
It's the mercy of God so that many would be saved. Remember this. God does not forgive sins so that you would get your life together. God forgives sins so that you would be kept alive. So look to what is being done for Joseph's brothers and say they didn't just stop being sinners, but to their broken consciences. They need the mercy, the promise of God, the forgiveness of sins. They need the gospel, and they should be given the gospel. Um, no, by no means should you just keep on sinning. It will hurt you. Even if God does use that pain for your good, sin still breaks stuff. Um, God works not apart from what sin breaks, but by dying and rising for sinners. He, he works by being the one who takes upon himself all that sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us, so that by him we might become the righteousness of God. He was destroyed and rebuilt as the temple in three days. Don't sin because it, it does real damage. But at the same time, don't look at yourself only according to the law. Look at yourself according to the gospel. If, if you're looking for a license to sin, you're not looking for the gospel. <laughs> you're looking for the law. A, a license to sin, an abuse of, of, of this thing still holds. The only thing in mind is I'm still concerned with this commandment that I intend on breaking. I'm not looking at the gospel. I'm not looking at Christ. I'm not looking a, about help or, or mercy. I just want to keep on with, with this thing, so I'll, I'll sort of keep Jesus off to the side because the only thing I'm really concerned about is how do I do this again but get away with it? This whole thing is about the gospel. No matter how sinful Joseph's brothers have been, God works good in the midst of this evil. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus, he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the, the mercy that, that is poured out to the people in need of it. This is the people uh, given mercy. Uh, and the, the, the center of the conversation is, um, is, is no longer than simply how do you earn this salvation? The center of the, salvation, or the, center of the conversation is the promise. This is actually fi how you figure out uh, whether or not to uh, start to, to talk about law or, or, or gospel in this. Does the conversation center around Christ with the sin being removed from you, or does it center around sin and thus remove Christ? Shall we sin that grace may abound? Go to Joseph's brothers. Is mercy at the center of what they're looking for? Or, and that, that sin that, that they just can't get out of their, their head is, is just always looming over them? Or is it the other way around? That, that really the only thing they're focused on is, is uh, getting more of whatever was wrong. And I, how can I just sort of sprinkle some Jesus on it to make the thing that I really want okay? If Jesus is a means to the end of your sin, that, that's not really Jesus. Um, but if Christ is actually at the center forgiving sinners. It can't be abuse. Understand that. If somebody comes to, 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 to God's house looking for forgiveness, the fear that they might sin again is pointless if Christ is at the center of what they're looking for, because that's the whole point of our religion. If Christ is forgiving sinners at the center of everything going on and that guilty conscience is being addressed, that's the whole religion. That's actually the whole point of the house being there in the first place. If, on the other hand, Christ is sitting on the periphery and the one thing that you're focused on is fixing that behavior. It's abuse even without the sin. Because anything that separates Christ from the center of the story, anything that separates the gospel from the sinner, that's the abuse. Whether or not somebody decides to sin some more, the abuse is setting Christ apart from the main thrust of God's mercy in this life. The, 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 the abuse is looking to the law for your salvation and not the gospel. The abuse is whenever you take Jesus out of the center of the picture and say, it's going to be me, either by how can I get away with this or how can I amend my life so that I'm not doing this anymore. It's, it's already abuse if Christ is on, on the periphery. If Christ is in the center, it can't be abuse because, well, it's the gospel being given to sinners, which is, again, the whole point of all of this. That's, that's the real problem. Um, what we really seem to want over and over again is a Jesus who'll just sit on the sidelines and cheer us on. Uh, we, we want a Jesus who'll just sort of give us the, the, the right motivation and, and encouragement and, and, you know, oomph to, to get it done ourselves. But that's not the verse. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. That means even though I, a poor, miserable sinner, mean evil, God will not let that be the end of the story. God will work good to bring about salvation. If 
all of, of, of your religion is just Jesus being a cheerleader for you, Jesus being a life coach for you. Whatever he is, he's not a savior because you're the one that has to do all the work. So Joseph assures his brothers that they aren't the main actors here. God is. God is the main actor in this story. Joseph uh, is actually uh, addressing something that is every bit as awful um, as sin. God forbids despair every bit as much as he forbids sin. Have you read through the Gospels and, and seen how many times Jesus warns his, his, his disciples, do not worry, do not be anxious, do not be afraid? How many times? God forbids despair every bit as much as he forbids sin. But for some reason, we've decided that um, what, what, what we really need to, to focus on is um, the sin which he has already forgiven. Never mind the despair. It's not that if you sin, God will abandon you. And it's not that if you despair, God will abandon you. It's that he doesn't want you to sin. And he also doesn't want you to despair because of your sin. Until he gives you the gospel. The free consolation that is Christ crucified and raised, given to you through word and sacrament. So that you wouldn't have to measure yourself by your sin and despair. You can look to him and let him be your identity. Him be your hope. Him being your, your life. Um, all of it. All of it is, is Christ at the center for sinners. That, that's everything to us. That, that's, that's the whole point. God meant this for good. Tied to the cross. And then uh, to, to wrap up the book of Genesis, uh, Joseph died too. Uh, it's almost an afterthought. Because, well, with so much life after death, why would that, uh, why would that matter? We're alive in Christ. So we'll go right from 21, this, this great absolution, right into 22. So Joseph remi remained in Egypt. He and his father's house, Joseph, lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then Joseph made his sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. God will visit you. Emmanuel, God with us, he's looking forward. Uh, he spent 13 years in affliction, but lived 110. Let's recognize something here, too, because that, that 110 years old is, is a, a, well, it's a verse. Whereas most of his story is sort of devoted to his suffering. Uh, sin and pain, they, they sort of compact how much time I'm willing to comprehend. Um, all of time and space shrinks when I stub my toe on the coffee table. The entire universe is my toe and the coffee table. That's all there is because the pain limits me being able to see anything else. It gives you tunnel vision. Sin is the same way. Uh, you can hear uh, the wages of sin is death, but you're like, yeah, but it'll feel good right now. It, it shortens your view from all of eternity into to right now. Uh, being sinned against, same thing. Uh, the gospel doesn't shorten time. It lengthens it. It promises an eternity even to sinners. And so I can say, you who are in the midst of pain, you will be comforted. You who are in the midst of pain, your God suffers with you and for you, and he, will ha he has redeemed you and will carry you forward now unto the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. You, you will not be measured by the dumb things you did today, but by the action done for you when Christ died upon the cross so that you would be carried forward into eternity. The gospel lengthens time. It allows us to conceive of more. And so it's not just sort of, you know, well, you know, you take the good, you take the bad, uh, you take the rest, and there you have the facts of life. Uh, it, it's not just sort of, you, you, you know, well, I, I mean, I guess those 13 years were a bummer, but you got 110 good ones. It, it's that, well, of course you remember the one bad thing that happened to you today and not the 10 good things. Sin compacts time. But if you're going to actually want to deal with the rest of it, it's not just sort of look on the bright sides. It's hear the gospel. <laughs> hear the gospel, the promised eternity, that you would uh, be reminded there's more to life right now than me in the coffee table. There's more to life right now than me in the sin that I'm fixated on or, or despairing from. There's a Christ who has redeemed us from sin and death. There's a Christ who has won for us the kingdom of God, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So as Joseph departs in peace, uh, we, we go out on the gospel, the recognition that God visits his people, uh, and he does not abandon us to this life, but he, he constantly makes himself present among us to forgive, to comfort, and to save. Uh, so 
I guess that's Genesis. Uh, and we'll go somewhere else another day. Thanks so much for uh, letting me come and talk at you through this screen for a little while. Uh, uh, we continue to, to, again, remember Pastor Borkhart and his family in our prayers, uh, and, and hopefully he'll be able to, to rejoin us soon. Lord be with you. Have a great day.